Welcome to the 48th Theoretical Physics Colloquium by Professor Jing Fen Liao. He's uh, from the Physics Department and Center for Exploration of Energy and Matter at Indiana University. He received his PhD degree in theoretical nuclear physics at Stony Brook University in 2008. He had a postdoctoral fellow position at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab between 2008 and 2010. Between 2010 and 11, he was a research associate at Brookhaven National Lab. In 2011, he received a faculty position at Indiana University and became a Rick and BNL fellow at BNL. Uh, he uh, had a number of honors uh, and awards over the years, starting from his PhD studies. He had a D. Tian Prize by Physics Department at Stony Brook University in 2006. In 2009, uh, he received Max Drazen Prize uh, again from Stony, Universe, Stony Brook University. In 2014, he had uh, the Early Career Award from NSF. He received some research award from uh, Indiana University, uh, recognized as an excellent referee by European Physical Journal and Nuclear Physics several times. He uh, serves for the community as the um, editorial board member of Chinese Physics C, actually the highest ranked Chinese uh, journal in physics as far as I know. His research interests include physics of heavy ion collisions, quark gluon plasma, anomalous properties of QGP, jet quenching in heavy ion collisions, transport properties, kinetic theory, and hydrodynamic methods in quark uh, QGP and many other things. And today he will be talking about relativistic nuclear collisions, factory for exotic quantum matter. And with that, I'll give the microphone to Jin Tan. Thank you, Igor. Let me uh, uh, start by thanking uh, Igor uh, for this wonderful opportunity and perhaps more importantly for, um, you know, uh, hosting this series of talks, uh, online talks over the past year, as he just mentioned, that basically this is getting to the one year anniversary for this series. I think many people in our community, like broadly uh, in the nuclear physics and perhaps beyond nuclear physics, have been uh, benefiting from this, uh, uh, you know, uh, colloquium series, uh, which you know help keep us, uh, us all united together in this kind of very difficult time, uh, without any conference workshops over the past year or so. Uh, let me uh, thank thank Igor again, and that's not only just speaking for me, and speaking for many people in our community. Uh, with that, let me uh, start my talk today. Uh, I'm going to talk about the relativistic nuclear collision, uh, but hopefully I will bring some kind of refreshing shots and some newest results uh, from the angle that we're considering the nuclear collision or the factory for exotic quantum matter. Uh, since Igor, and by the way, so as Igor already said, so I, I always welcome uh, questions if you have during the talk. Um, so. Uh, since Igor told me that I should consider this as a, a colloquium, you know, with a typical colloquium uh, audience. So I will start with a little bit more like uh, a general kind of big picture. So, well, you know, uh, a, a large part of physics is trying to understand structure of matter. And that's really a uh, quite ancient quest, which can be dated back all the way to the uh, philosophers from the East and from the West, you know, like, more than 2000 years ago. But even at that time, people came to the kind of conception that all matter is made from a set of fundamental quantities. So basically like you have a few, you know, basic fundamental elements or, or atoms or whatever, or DAO, you know, that can, uh, you know, generate all the matter we see in our universe. So that was sort of the real, uh, the kind of, you know, old idea that started quite early, but it really took uh, a lot you know, uh, kind of progress and a success of many, many generations of physicists to eventually establish that kind of, you know, idea. Uh, and that, of course, uh, is uh, what we now call the standard model uh, of particle physics. Uh, this really is sort of continuing 2000 years of kind of reductionism, you know, from the beginning to the, to the almost like end, that's called a temporary end. Uh, you know, when, when the uh, Higgs particle was discovered in uh, 2012. Now this little uh, picture here summarizes what we know about the structure of matter at that kind of fundamental particle level. So we have quarks, 
we have leptons, we have gauge boson that mediate the interaction, and then we have Higgs boson that holds everything together by giving mass to everybody. Uh, this is a very, very, of course, elegant construction that basically fulfilled the kind of early idea of the, uh, our philosophers. Um, the question here is that kind of what's next? But there are many things that you can think about. Uh, there's certainly the direction of further uh, reductionism. I'm using this word not in a negative sense, but in a positive sense, because uh, we, we know, almost know for sure that there are something beyond the standard model. Uh, for example, uh, many, of, I mean, if you have been attending some of those colloquium, you certainly have heard things like dark matter or dark energy, which are obviously outside this little chart here. Uh, there are also many very, very justified questions about why the standard model looks the way it is. And there is also the question about neutrino, uh, you know, nature, whether that is the, uh, you know, Marirala particle or not. There are many of these questions that, that sort of continue our, that kind of quest, namely to understand the most basic kind of construction of all matter in our universe. Now there is another opposite direction that is to try to do some integration back, uh, meaning that you know, uh, given this little chart here, how you put them together and, and you know, you get the different kinds of material that you see in the nature. And that's not easy actually, it even could be more challenging in some sense. Uh, a good example, of course, is the condensed matter physics. As everybody knows, you know, the condensed matter physics uh, is based on fundamental, fundamental interaction uh, that, like, you know, electromagnetism, basically. However, it can give you many, many interesting phenomena that are, you know, uh, not easy to understand and sometimes puzzling and, you know, uh, sometimes surprising. So these are collectively, uh, uh, you know, have been called what we, you know, the kind of emerging phenomena. And that's, I think, the bigger part of physics right now in, uh, you know, in our century, I think. Uh, if you look at almost every physics department, the biggest component is perhaps the condensed matter. There's nothing bad about that because you know, that's actually uh, equally important and perhaps even more challenging in some sense. So uh, that's what I'm gonna focus on short, uh, in nuclear physics in some, uh, you know, in a way, uh, today's nuclear physics is more about the integration back, okay? Uh, so, so what is nuclear physics? This is really just for, for lay people who, you know, uh, who are not really working on nuclear physics. Well, sometimes people say nuclear physics is exploring the heart of matter. If you look at our physical world, you start with matter like kind of a drop of water, but water of course is made of many, many uh, billions and billions and billions of molecules. And each molecule, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's further made of, you know, atom, like, you know, here, you know, these pictures. Um, Atoms are on a scale of about a millionth of a millimeter. So that's already kind of very, very small. It's a you know, microscopic quantum world. But you look, if you look deeply into uh, the inside space of the atom, you will find this uh, you know, atomic nucleus. Atomic nucleus goes down by another uh, uh, you know, five order magnitude in scale. It's about a trillionth of a millimeter. So that's really small. Now, uh, there are all kinds of nucleus that you find, you know, for all different elements in your uh, periodic table. Uh, if you look more carefully uh, into the nucleus by, you know, uh, for example, uh, uh, collision experiment and, uh, you know, other tools we have in, in, in the nuclear physics, you will realize that all these different atomic nucleus, uh, uh, nuclei are made from even smaller basic particles that, that we call the hadrons in general. Uh, in particular, proton and neutrons, which are the most familiar to people. And proton and neutrons are being held together by nuclear force. At this level, we can say the nuclear force is mediated by something we call hadron, like pi on, pro, you know, pi on, k on, omega, and so on. Uh, these are what we call mesons. So they together make the hadronic world. And then, you know, eventually, if you are able to break up, uh, you cannot really break up, but if you can really kind of take the images of proton, uh, you will see that there are even smaller structures in there. And that, those are what we call the quark and gluon. So these are the most basic entities. Uh, the dynamics of quark gluons are described by a fundamental uh, quantum field theory that, that is called quantum chromodynamic QCD. Uh, most of the people here in the audience perhaps are familiar with that. So I'm not gonna uh, say too much about it. Uh, uh, the only thing I want to point out is that there is a fundamental theory for strong nuclear force. And it is a non abelian gauge theory. And there's one important feature of that theory, and that is 
the, that the gluons, the gauge field, are non-abelian gauge fields, which means they self-interact. They, you know, gluons interact with gluons. This, this is different and very, very different from photon, which is for electromagnetism. Photon and photon doesn't interact directly, or gluons do. And that brings all the difference. Uh, perhaps the most important feature coming out of that is something we call asymptotic freedom, which is say that the kind of basic coupling strong due to this kind of you know, QCD interaction becomes small and sm smaller and smaller at high energy or, or short distance scale. Well, that also means that you know, when you go down in energy scale to the no energy side, or you, know, you go to large uh, distance uh, scale, that uh, kind of interaction strong will blow up, just like showing in this picture. And that happens roughly around these scales here. Uh, of energy scale of 200 MeV, million electron volt, or of distance about one Fermi, and that's about the size of a proton. This is where the quark mass becomes very, very hard. And that's why we're still busy understanding, okay? If it were easy, it would have been totally solved. So today we're still working on this. Now, to give you an idea of that kind of difficulty of the quark mass on this kind of scale, uh, let me uh, uh, briefly talk about one uh, you know, uh, feature of QCD, and that's something we call confinement. Uh, or sometimes people say there are missing particles, namely the quarks and gluons are not seen in the physical observed state. Indeed, if you open uh, you know, the particle data book, which summarizes all you know, established and almost established facts about particle physics, you will see this entry that's been there for a long time, which says free quark search, and it says all searches since 1977 have had negative results. So what that means is that you, know, you are in a kind of you know, awkward situation where on one, on one hand you say you have a basic theory that you know, uh, uh, involves quarks and gluons. On the other hand, you say you never see a quark, not a single quark. So what happened? Apparently something is mysterious about QCD. Uh, and indeed, uh, on that kind of scale that I mentioned uh, here, the interaction becomes so strong, so non-perturbative that many crazy things happen. And until today, we're still working hard to understand that. But we collectively call this situation as just confinement. A simple way to understand it to, is to say that the kind of force between a quark and anti-quark, let's say we quantify that with the quark anti-quark potential, that potential grows uh, linearly with the distance between the two uh, quark and anti-quark. And that, of course, becomes impossible to separate because it will take an infinite amount of energy to separate. This is the way to, to manifest that, you know, non perturbative dynamics is happening and, you know, dictating the behavior of the, you know, quark system at large distance. Uh, and what really happened, of course, uh, showing this kind of illustration from lattice simulation is that the Kind of gluon field and non-perturbative gluon field are organized in a very very different way. Uh, you know, uh, when you use separate quark and anti-quark to large distance. So this is one example of the difficulty of, of understanding QCD at that kind of you know non-perturbative scale. Another uh, example: the hadron structure. We say uh, quarks are bound inside hadron, like meson, pion, kaon, you know, or baryon, proton, neutron, and so on. However, you know, till today, people are still very, you know, working very, very hard to try to understand what are all the possible ways for putting the quarks together into hadron. In addition to this kind of standard hadron, people have long suspected that there should be, you know, something we call exotic hadron. Namely, you could have a bound state of four quarks, namely two quarks, two underquarks, or even five quarks, you know, what people call tetraquark or, you, you know, um, pentaquarks. Understanding the kind of quark mass of hadron, uh, you know, in this kind of uh, structure is still very, very challenging. This is still an exciting frontier of today's nuclear phase research in the hadronic physics. Uh, understanding those should give us uh, a lot of information about the non perturbative force, how that works, you know, uh, in binding quarks into hadron. So this is another example to study the exotic hadron. Now, uh, we uh, are mostly working in the heavy ion field you know, using a collision to create, uh, you know, what we call quark plasma. So why we are doing this, you know, that's another way of studying the quark dynamics. We basically do that by cooking up a quark soup. It, this is a little bit like what condensed matter people would do. You know, you try to change the external condition for the, you know, nuclear system to exist. You change the temperature, 
you change density, you change the all kind of handle that you have, and see what happens. It's like when you you know heat time you know heat up a, a part of water, it will turn into vapor. So we're hoping that you know by uh, you know increasing temperature of the nuclear system, you can you know really sort of break up all those protons and, and and neutrons and so on, and get into a different state of matter that is like a quark too. And indeed, uh, you know uh, that was initially uh, proposed you know, by the late 1970s and over the past four decades, you know, people are, you know, uh, working hard to realize that kind of, you know, early idea. And that indeed turned out to be the case, especially that, you know, with today's supercomputers, uh, that QCD calculation have been able to show clearly that there is a transition. It's not a true phase transition, it's a rapid crossover from a hadron world uh, into a quark gluon world. Okay, that transition happens roughly around this temperature, about 155, 160 MeV, or roughly about a trillion degree. So below that, you get a gas of hadron, like mainly pion, and uh, which are the lightest hadron. And on the higher temperature side, you get the quark gluon plus. And many important properties of QCD will change. For example, something called chirosymmetry, which is simultaneously broken uh, in the vacuum, will be restored at the high temperature side. So we are focusing on understanding QCD dynamics in a setup of quarks tube, many, many quarks, and a gluon, of course. Now, uh, that's something we call quark gluon plasma. That's actually the interesting material because it, it, it was an old phase of matter. If you look at the cosmic evolution of our today's world, so we're roughly here now. You know, the temperature of today's universe is about, you know, 3K, that's a famous cosmic radiation background temperature. If you trace back the evolution of the universe all the way back. Now, you remember that the, the, the universe was supposed to start with the Big Bang and then it's rapidly expanded and cooled down. Now, if you trace that you know, evolution history back at about a few microseconds after that Big Bang, the starting point, you would have a temperature that is about 20 degrees and high. So our quark gluon plasma should be there. It should somehow uh, occupy the early universe. So that's really a kind of old phase of matter. Of course, that was long gone, right? We're now here. Uh, however, you know, we can recreate that phase of matter uh, by using collision experiment. So that's what we call heavy ion collision. Uh, the QGP now is of course can be considered a new phase of matter because we normally only get hadron or nuclei. Okay. Now we say we can cook up a quark soup by colliding two large nuclei. So that happened at uh, something we call large, you know, relativistic heavy ion collider at Brookhaven National Lab, and also large hadron collider at the third lab. So we have these two giant machines that smash the kind of nuclei, large nuclei, like gold nucleus or lead nucleus into each other. And by, you know, turning that kind of kinetic energy of the beam into thermal energy, you can create a really hot material. Okay. So what happened in the heavy ion collision? These are some cartoons. So this is the three-dimensional cartoon X, Y, Z. Z is what we call the beam direction, and X and Y, so X is what we call the impact parameter direction. This is what we call outplane direction. You can see the two nuclei are very highly Lorentz contracted, and they have some overlapping region when they you know, meet with each other. In this overlapping region, that's where the collision happen, and all the kind of kinetic, not all, but a good fraction of that kinetic energy or moving energy of the initial nuclei will be turned into thermal energy, you know, very short time scale. So you create a really hot spot here. And that hot spot contains what we call quark gluon plasma. And that little thing is not going to stay there. It's just like our universe. It's going to start to expand, uh, you know, toward the cold vacuum outside, right? So it, it expands toward the cold environment, then it cools itself down, and eventually it turns back into hadron. And those hadrons are what we're going to see in the in the uh, what are called detector. There are many large detectors working at those collision experiments. For example, there are Star and Felix at, uh, at RIC and also, uh, you know, Atlas, CMS, Alice, and also RHCB and the RHC. So if you only look at the two dimensional, uh, you know, uh, X, Y plane, so you can see here, uh, this is what is called in plane, X direction, out plane, Y direction. Again, you can see there's the overlapping region. That's where all the interesting things happen. Uh, so in the past two decades, uh, a lot of experiment or measurements were done and a lot of theoretical work were done. So uh, let me just 
put that two decades of effort into one sentence that is that core gluon plasma is created in such collision. So that's a big statement because before this, we, we were not sure whether we created or not. Now we are sure that we create core gluon plasma with that kind of temperature. And then it has been called the hottest matter, obviously. Uh, you know, it holds a facial gen genus record of the highest man-made temperature. And also uh, one of the big discovery, I would say, one uh, from the, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, what are the signatures of QGP? I mean, how, how do you know that QGP is formed? Okay, that, that's a good question. So it's really not, uh, it's, it basically calls a, a collection of evidence together, okay? Uh, there are several reasons to, to say that QGP is created because, yeah, for example, you can, you can measure uh, the emitted hadron and the photon factor to infer the temperature. But by looking at that spectra, it's like the black body radiation. You look at that spectra, uh, you know, yield versus energy, you would be able to extract some temperature if this is a thermal source. You can also, you know, focus on the hydrodynamic, the kind of expansion dynamics. And it has been firmly established in the past two decades that uh, maybe not everybody agrees, but I think it's, you know, uh, beyond the reasonable doubt that there is a hydrodynamic expansion and by studying what comes out of that expansion, you can infer back what was the initial condition to start with. And again, that kind of energy density and that kind of uh, temperature combined with the lattice QCD simulation, first principle lattice QCD simulation. Together, I think we can conclude that at the very beginning of collision in the central uh, collision zone, you have a very hot material and that temperature is certainly well above the uh, lattice indicated transition temperature. Okay. Uh, yeah, and another, you. yeah. And another important aspect coming out the past two decades of study is that uh, people uh, conclude that this, you know, expanding material is uh, behaves like a nearly perfect fluid. It's perhaps the most perfect fluid in the sense that it has the smallest shear viscosity over entropy density ratio, which is basically quantified ability for that fluid to flow. Okay. So uh, and that you know kind of share with Cosby appear to be in the quantum liquid region. Okay. I don't want to expand too much on that. I think perhaps last week there was already a talk on focusing on flow and things like that. So I, I, I would just say that we, I think the majority of the community agree on this thing. The core ground plasma is created, it's the hottest material, it's the most perfect fluid. So now uh, let me continue, what's next? Okay, so here we're basically entering the third decade of the rig start, okay? So what's next? Uh, let me borrow some wisdom from condensed matter physics. You know, in condensed matter physics, if you uh, are able to create a new material, or if you have something like interesting quantum materials at hand, uh, you want to play with it. What, how you play with it? Well, you apply strong magnetic field, for example. If you have a pure sample and you apply super strong magnetic field, you're gonna see the quantum hole, you are gonna discover actually quantum hole effect, fractional quantum hole effect, all those kind of strong quality electron system. So that's exciting. Uh, or you can try to change and play with the quantum, you know, the kind of chemical composition and that can lead to surprise. For example, this is a perfect example, high temperature superconductor by adding a little bit of doping uh, of certain material or certain element, you could dr drastically change the behavior of that, that material. And you can find something new. A uh, latest example, you know, if you have a, you know, sheet of graphene and you, you can put bilayers of graphene and then you say, okay, what else can I do? I just treat the two layers by a little bit. If you are hitting the magical angle again, you get some really surprising discovery. So that's what the condensed matter people do. You know, if you have a new material, you have an interesting material, you try to play with it with all kinds of, you know, handles you have. What handle do we have? Well, we don't have much because Having a collision is a very violent process, okay? You don't have a lot of good control over it. Uh, fortunately, we still have something. One of the things that you can do is to change the beam energy of the collision. And that kind of beam energy, uh, uh, you know, the change of beam energy actually allow you to change some of the condition for that QGP. It's an interesting change. You know, it's not just you, you can easily change or apply some particular external condition. You can only change the collision energy and to try and kind of shift the, uh, the core gluon plasma or hot material you create from one region to another. So right now we have a lot of experiments going on. We have at a very high, so 
at very high energy end, like you know, on the order of thousand GeV collision beam energy, we have the LTC, and then at hundred uh, GeV collision, we have the rig. Uh, if you go a little bit down, you know, through the beam energy scan and rig, you can explore region uh, somewhere between three GeV all the way to two hundred GeV. Now there are a few uh, future uh, uh, facilities here. You can see that you can go down to even GeV energy. Okay. So we basically the, the kind of handle we have is like a uh, collision beam energy from uh, water GeV to water thousand GeV, okay? So what does that bring us? So that's what I'm gonna talk about uh, in the rest of this talk. Uh, uh, my, my point is that I think that really provides us a, a factory for exotic quantum matter in addition to what we usually talk about, namely changing temperature and density of the nuclear system. We have a number of interesting new dimensions to explore. For example, we can have really strong magnetic field. We have, you know, chirality or chiral imbalance in the core gluon plasma. Uh, our core gluon plasma can carry a, a sizable angular momentum and actually start to spin around or rotate around. Or we can even, uh, you know, do some kind of doping with heavy flavor in the core gluon plasma that we create. So I'm going to talk about each of this to give you some example. Uh, so let me start with the first two, the kind of, you know, um, chirality uh, and the vertex and the magnetic field. This is, I think, a, a, a rapid developing uh, direction in our heavy ion physics. Uh, really, I think that this pointing to a new paradigm, uh, namely to consider the kind of material we create in those collisions, not to be not only a perfect fluid of, of energy and momentum, it could also be a quantum spin fluid. In the past two decades, we focused on the energy and momentum transport in this created material. We say from that, we see the elliptic flow, triangular flow, you know, uh, all that, and the shear viscosity, bulk of viscosity. So those are basically quantifying the energy momentum transport. But what happens to spin degree of freedom in the fluid? I, obviously, there are, there are spin. For example, quark, every quark carries a spin. Gluons carry spin too, but they're they are kind of harder to detect. But quarks are easier to detect. So we want to play with those kind of spin degree of freedom in the fluid. So how do we play with spin? Well, that's very well known from, you know, it has a known history dating all the way back to the atomic physics and also to condensed matter physics at the very beginning of the 20th century. Uh, you can play with that uh, with a few, uh, you know, handles. You can apply magnetic field. Obviously that leads to all the kind of atomic spectrum lines, splitting, z mine effect, you know, uh, Einstein to Hess and all that. Uh, you can also kind of rotate up. I'm going to talk a little more about that. That's what, what I call rotational polarization. And finally, you can also, uh, you know, create an environment with net chirality where, you know, chirality will also imply a polarization of speed, okay? In, in heavy ion collision, in the matter we create in those collisions, we actually are lucky to have a condition like this. So those conditions can, uh, uh, you know, have interesting interplay with the spin degree, the freedom of the material. And that can lead to many novel phenomena that we observe. Now, let me say that you know this kind of physics really is getting a lot closer to what people do in the condensed matter, the kind of interplay of spin with chirality, vertex, and magnetic field. Uh, not only that, you know, it's interesting to us, it's also interesting to condensed matter physics. So here is an excellent source from Igor and collaborator, where he discussed uh, the kind of you know interplay of spin with magnetic field in particular, and how that could lead to interesting. Uh, properties both in uh, you know uh, relativistic system and also in some of the condensed matter system. Uh, so let me uh, uh, briefly say that you know, uh, to give you an example. There's something we call Einstein's half effect. I, I don't want to go too much into that. Basically, what you do is that if you change the magnetic moment of certain magnetic material, you would you would cause a mechanical rotation. What happens is that you know you're because the magnetic moment is really uh, tied to the microscopic mechanical motion like a molecular current or the spin of the uh, uh, particles or, or atoms inside the, the sample. So this is really a magnetic polarization idea, okay? Uh, it turns out that there are both of course orbital and spin contribution. Einstein and his collaborators, they, they initially only thought about the orbital contribution, but what's actually turned out to be more important the spin contribution uh, in this kind of effect. It was, that was actually first measured correctly by Barnett, uh, which is, which was, uh, who was an like, American physicist at Ohio State. Uh, he correctly measured this number two, actually. 
namely the change in the magnetic moment and change in the angular moment should be connected with this factor two in there. And that indicated the dominant, dominant spin contribution in the magnetic station, actually. And he didn't stop there. He uh, went on to uh, propose what we call Barnett effect today. Uh, he said basically that the, the opposite should also happen. So here in the Einstein, the hat effect, you say that if you change the magnetic moment, you should be able to change, uh, cause a mechanical rotation. But then he said that if you can change the mag, you know, angular momentum or rotation of the solid sample, you should cause the magne magnetic moment to change as well. So that was published in like, uh, you know, very early on, 19, uh, uh, 1915, okay. Uh, you know, one paper in the science and the measurement in the physical review. This is of course uh, uh, really essentially uh, assuming the rotation of right here, if you think about it. The essential, uh, they didn't say that, but the essential assumption underlying the Barnett effect is the rotation of precision. What happens is you start spinning a you know, solid sample with some angular speed. And that's the macroscopic rotation, of course. But then that kind of macroscopic rotation will polarize the individual spin of microscopic particles in there. So you have more particle spin to be aligned with the, the, uh, the rotation than anti-aligned. So that indeed would give you a magnetic moment. And that's what he measured. However, the, so what he showed was for solid sample. It uh, certainly, I mean, this is a very general effect. This should be true also for liquid, you know, fluid. However, it is a lot trickier to see that for liquid or fluid. And spin, uh, I, I remind you, it's kind of fragile in the sense that, you know, it's a little quantum degree of freedom and it's very, very uh, difficult to measure. And, and indeed, uh, that's what's you know, still something that condensed matter people are very interested in doing. So in this paper that, uh, that was published in 2016, they actually were trying to demonstrate that. They were able to demonstrate the spin kind of polarization by fluid vorticity in a viscous fluid flow. And they even you know, envision the kind of idea that fluid spintronics, meaning that you use fluid vorticity to control spin and control the electron transport, okay? So this is very interesting to them. It's certainly also interesting to us because in heavy ion collision, uh, it turns out there's a large angular momentum carried by the colliding system. So this is the X, Z, uh, uh, what we call the reaction plane uh, view. Uh, these are the nuclei that are moving against each other. They are trying to collide in a typical line central collision. You can see the central mass of the two nuclei are, are shifted uh, or misaligned by the impact parameter B. You can see in this case, just by you know general physics, you know one hundred one, you know that there is an angular momentum, which is R cross P, right? So you have a large angular momentum in the y direction, which goes like a nuclear nuclear mass times the b, uh, the uh, impact parameter times the beam energy, which basically quantifies the kind of momentum. Okay, so this is basically R cross P. You will put numbers for Rick and RHC, it can be ten to the four to five h bar. I remind you, this is a big because. Uh, for a typical atom, which is much larger than a nucleus, the highest spin you can get probably is on the order of 10 to 100 h bar. Even for some of the high spin nuclei, nucleus, it can go up to about 100 h bar. This is 10 to the 4 h bar in a small volume. The volume is just on the order of nucleus itself. So that's a large angular momentum carried by a small system. Uh, it was, I think, it was. Uh, 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 Zhuo Tang Liang and, and Xin Liang Wang in 2005, they started to ask maybe this kind of orbital angular moment could you know, lead to some observable effect. And indeed, they basically, what they demonstrated was, was like a more microscopic idea, namely two particles uh, you know, colliding with the non-zero angular orbital angular momentum. And they argue and they show that that would cause the final state uh, particle, the outgoing particle would have a spin polarization in line, uh, in line with the initial angular momentum. Okay, that makes complete sense. The kind of modern idea of the you know, uh, global polarization in Haiwan, I think, uh, was then uh, uh, based on more on the paper from Bakatili and collaborators and perhaps also a few other authors uh, around 2008 and later 2013. Basically, that's the fluid dynamic scenario. If you have a fluid that carries non-zero angular momentum, it has to sort of develop vorticity. And that vorticity will polarize you know, individual particle spin. So this is the formula that they derived basically from the thermodynamics of a rotating system. So uh, in short, it basically says the spin is gonna be aligned with the vorticity here. This is the thermal vorticity. I'm not going into the technical detail. Just the idea is simple. The idea is like this. You have a vorticity and that polarizes the spin to be aligned with the vorticity. This is just a you know, 
relativity covariant version of that statement. All right, so are we going to be able to see that question? The bigger question is that, are we have a, do we have a chance to see that? So uh, I got interested in this kind of problem in about 2014, 2015, and then uh, the first step I tried was to try to calculate what happened to that angular moment. Remember, you start with this angular moment, but there are many questions, actually. First question, what fraction stayed in the QGP? When you look at this, this picture here, uh, I'm coming a little bit back here. Not all the angular moments are in the QGP. Actually, most of the angular moments are not in the QGP. They're in the spectator, what are called spectator, which simply fly by. So there's a big question of how much of this, what fraction of this angular moment is still in the core gluon plasma. So we use a, a modeling uh, tool that's called AMPT to, to explore this question. Uh, our conclusion that up to about 20% can stay in QGP, and that strongly depends on the collision beam energy. Actually, at low beam energy, you have a lot that stay in the system, or in the high beam energy, you have very little that stay in the, in the, in the QGP. The, the next question is that is that portion in the QGP also conserved? We, of course, know for sure that angular momentum must be conserved. Total angular momentum must be conserved, but not a part of it. So that's a big question as well. We showed numerically that that portion carried by QGP basically stays within the QGP, okay? And that's very important as well. And then the question is how the QGP accommodate that angular momentum. And that, an that answer uh, is simple. It, it develops very complex fluid vorticity pattern. You can see here, all these you know, counter plots are showing vorticity. Somewhere it's positive, somewhere it's negative. That vorticity defined like this uh, can be very complicated. The reason why it's complicated, that's because our QGP is a very highly compressible fluid. It's very, very different from a you know, rigid body. A rigid body with angular momentum will just rotate as a whole object, but a compressible fluid will develop this kind of you know, local vorticity pattern. But if you add all these patterns together, they don't cancel out. They still have a non-zero net vorticity. And that is what we are plotting in this, uh, this picture. The average of vorticity over the fluid divided by temperature as a function of time, how that evolves. You can see the big, you know, drops in time, and that makes sense because the system is expanding. In our language, you may say, uh, in a simple language, you say, that's because the whole system of course has a moment of inertia that is increasing. So with fixed angular moment, your vorticity is gonna decrease, basically. But the important finding here is that, uh, you can see we did that study for, you know, energy, collision energy from 100, 200 GeV all the way down to about, you know, on the order 10 GeV. It turns out that vorticity, average of vorticity, will grow strongly with beam energy. So the big message here is that uh, you know, if you want to look for the kind of rotating rotation effect, uh, one to two, one to ten GeV collision energy is where you want to look at. Okay, and that turned out to be actually useful for our experimental friends uh, to focus their effort, and they they have been trying to measure the global polarization of particles coming out of the collision as an evidence of that kind of you know angular momentum. And indeed, uh, STAR successfully did that in 2016 and 2017. They published this paper uh, featured by Nature on the cover called Subatomic World. Basically, they measured the hyperon production from the collision. They measured hyperon you know, you know, spin polarization. Uh, so that's shown in this picture. You can see there's the global angular momentum of the system, and then the, polar, uh, the, the hyperon spin is polarized to that direction. So that's what they measure. You can see that the polarization is kind of not large, it's on a few percent level, but it, indeed it grows strongly with the beam energy. You can see, especially when you go into the order 10 GeV uh, collision region, it's very large. You can make the connection between that you know, polarization signal and the average fluid vorticity based on that formula from Beccatelli, and you will get something like this, on the order 10 to the uh, 21, 22 per second. This is huge, okay? Certainly, the most vertical fluid for sure, uh, and uh, that measurement of the global polarization has been quickly confirmed also by various calculations. This is just one example, but there are many other examples this, based on hydrodynamic, based on transport models. You know, all kinds of models. They all seem to suggest that indeed this measurement, the global polarization, can be nicely explained by the kind of fluid vorticity and you know that kind of spin polarization effect from fluid vorticity. Uh, there's an interesting question is that what happens, you know, when you go beyond that range? You can see in this publication from STAR, it goes down all the way to about 7.7 .7 GeV. Now STAR had more, you know. They recently did analysis of the 3 GeV and 5 GeV collision at the rake. 
uh, through the, the fake target experiment. I think um, HADAS also has even lower energy measurement. The question is what, what's going to happen to this trend at O1 GeV? That's an interesting question. Recently, we have been looking to this with the uh, uh, collaborators, uh, Yu Guo and, and Hui Zhang. So perhaps we'll have something to show soon. But for now, let's say uh, it's going to be interesting what happened here. Okay. All right. What so, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. From the Haggis experiment, we, we saw that uh, at the lowest energy around 2.4 GeV, it goes to zero. The polarization is zero. Uh, uh, right. Oh, but with a with, uh, with, uh, very large error bar, right? So what? I mean, so there is no explanation behind it, right? I mean, why uh, this is so? I think there's a there's a read there has some good reason why it can turn back. So so that uh, again, as I said, we I think we have been looking at this and we have something to say, and hopefully the uh, we'll have a paper that will appear soon. And and shouldn't be good, uh, for the global polarization this lambda and lambda bar difference shouldn't yeah, be. That, that, uh -huh. Yeah, that, that's a good question. Right? Uh, right. Uh, I'm coming to that. You mean the difference between lambda and lambda bar? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, indeed. That's an interesting puzzle here. You see a visible difference, even though there's still an large error bar. You see a diff visible difference between lambda bar and lambda predicting here. And with uh, you know the 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 predicting is larger for lambda bar than lambda. So why is that? Because Rotation, the fluid rotation doesn't care about the particle or antiparticle. That formula from Bacteria wouldn't tell you this particle or antiparticle. So something else must be happening if this measurement is statistically significant. And one possibility is that there is a uh, magnetic field. Okay, that one, you know, that idea was not proposed by other first. There's a number of people pointed that out. Uh, like, you know, uh, for example, uh, uh, yeah, Mike and, and Sergey and, and uh, um, also uh, uh, Andres Schaffer and also uh, Ben Milner and so on. There were several papers pointing out that possibility, namely the magnetic field can cause an extra splitting between the particle and antiparticle, which is indeed true. If you look at lambda and anti-lambda, they have opposite magnetic moment, even though they are, they are neutral particles, but they are composite particles. So they do have that zero magnetic moment. You open part of the data book, you can find the numbers. So it turns out that if you have a magnetic field aligned with omega, the rotation, then lambda bar will be polarized this way and lambda will polarize in the opposite way. And that's just because they're the sign of their magnetic moment, okay? And that indeed would be able to provide a, a you know, sensible solution to that puzzle. Uh, we actually uh, quantitatively explore that, that, that idea. So uh, assuming that this kind of lambda bar and lambda polarization difference is indeed due to a magnetic field, you can actually extract the uh, the the leading mag late time magnetic field that you would you would need in order to explain that splitting. Okay, and then we found that that turned out to be uh, phenomenologically viable. And there's of course the question of uh, why there is a magnetic field there. Uh, you know, even at a late time when the patterns are produced. Okay, and one possibility is that there is a perhaps a sub subatomic version of the Barnett effect. Meaning that you have a rotating fluid, especially in the low energy collision. You have a spinning fluid and you have a charged fluid because at low energy due to the nuclear stopping, you would have non zero, uh, quite a sizable electric charge in there. And that could provide a, a contribution to the late time magnetic field and therefore the uh, splitting uh, in the polarization between lambda and anti lambda. Okay. Uh, if you're interested in that, you can look at these papers. Okay, uh, there are of course many exciting new devices. I, I, you know, given the time uh, limit, I cannot cover all of them. So I, I want to refer you to something that is coming up. Maybe in a few months, we'll have a, a, a new volume in the Nectar Note in Physics that'll be published and, and you know, uh, accessible. So it's called Strongly Interacting Matter and Rotation. So it's been uh, uh, co-edited by Francesco, Michael, and me. Uh, we have a nice introduction chapter, uh, which is posted in the archive. So if you're interested, you can take a look. Um, we have 12 chapters discussing various, you know, aspects, theory, you know, phenomenology and experiment, uh, you know, around this uh, new kind of sub-direction of our field, the strongly interactive matter and the rotation. All right, so let me also, let me then continue to, uh, and then my next example uh, uh, for the nuclear collision of the factory for uh, exotic quantum matter. Uh, I would argue that it's perhaps also not only the most uh, vertical fluid, it's also the most magnetized fluid. And indeed, if you look at this picture again, those 
fast moving ion, they carry a large uh, positive charge, both of them. So that means, of course, you have two charges moving fast. They both create magnetic field, okay? Just by simple electromagnetism, Maxwell equation. So therefore, the, uh, you know, created the hot material in the middle will see or experience that strong magnetic field. If you, know, if you use your right-hand rule, you will figure out that the magnetic field will be pointing in the Y direction or out plane direction. It is really strong because the ions are moving very fast. At rate energy, your gamma factor of the ion would be only one of 100, where at RHC, it will be a thousand, okay? And there's an energy Z for those ions, for example, for gold, it would be 79 positive charge. For lead, it would be, I think, 80, 88. Uh, it, in any case, it's huge. Oh, sorry, 82, for, for lead is 82. So they're huge. So if you do a simple estimate of the natural magnetic field in those kind of collisions, it can be as large as a few times the m pi square. So that's a huge number. It's a hydronic scale quantity, okay? So that means the magnetic field is strong enough to influence the hydronic system or quark gluon system we create in those collisions. I remind you the temperature scale is also on the order of, of a few m pi. So they're not water magnitude difference. But on the other hand, and if you convert that into the you know, typical scale of uh, you know, uh, general physics, it's 10 to the 15 Tesla. It's the strongest we know. This is a picture showing the magnetic field line you know, on the X, Y plane. You, know, you can see in the, this is where the QGP is created. In the QGP zone, you can see there's a relatively homogeneous strong magnetic field pointing in the Y direction. Now, uh, I call it a subatomic lightning because it's just like a lightning. It lasts for a very short time. Because those ions on the side, uh, the uh, spectator, they just leave the, uh, the collision zone very quickly. So uh, it, they're short-lived. Uh, and that basically goes down in beam energy, like one over uh, beam energy or one over gamma. So the optimal, so because of the uh, two effect, on one hand, strong growth with, with beam energy. On the other hand, lifetime decrease with beam energy. It turns out it seems like the optimal re range for the B-field effect would be on the order of like 100 GeV or so. Okay, so uh, what would be interesting to look at? There are many effects. Actually, if you search the literature, there are a huge amount of uh, literature uh, studying various aspects of a magnetized quark gluon plasma, you know, magnetized quark matter in general, you know, all kinds of discussion, all kinds of interesting effects. So I'm gonna just give you one example, and that's the uh, chiral magnetic effect. The chiral magnetic effect, uh, uh, it has attracted a lot of attention recently, uh, not only from our field, but from other fields as well. Uh, again, uh, if I want to discuss this in detail, I would have to have another hour. So I'm not gonna do that. Instead, I would just say this is really interesting. Uh, what it says is a very simple formula. They say that, you know, if you have something what, that we call chiral material, you apply a magnetic field, you will see an electric current. Now, this normally doesn't happen because B is the axial vector quantity, where J is the vector quantity. So this relation, uh, you know, will break uh, parity and actually also CP parity, uh, you know, uh, right away. So it wouldn't happen and unless you have an environment that by itself is not P and CP even. And that's what is called chiral material, which is uh, schematically represented by this quantity mu five. Mu five is what is called the parity or chiral asymmetry which is the difference between the right-handed and left-handed fermions in your system. So only in that kind of environment, you can have an effect like this. It's a kind of a new electricity, I would say. It's not the usual electricity where you turn on an electric field, you get a, a, a conducting current. Here you turn on a magnetic field, and because of that chirality, you get an electric current. And it's a quantum mechanical transport process. It's also a, a reflection of macroscopic chiral anomaly. Uh, this is a very famous, of course, the VVA kind of, uh, you know, triangle or chiral anomaly. Now, this coefficient comes entirely from that. Okay, that's why we say it's, a, you know, basically a macroscopic chiral anomaly. To generate this is not easy, actually. That had to rely on the chiratian topology. Uh, either in our QCD system or more broadly, let's say, even in semi metal, you need to, you know, create that chirality. And the way to create that chirality is to couple your fermion, your chiral fermion, to topological configuration of the gauge field. Either a parallel E dot B field in the semi metal, or here in our QCD system, there are something we call, uh, you know, uh, instantons and spatterons that create topological trees and therefore create chirality imbalance. Okay. In short, this is a very simple formula that encodes a lot of interesting physics. 
and it has strong interdisciplinary interests. We certainly want to look for it in our heavy ion system. Now, it, the physics of the CME is actually easy to understand. I, I, I'm going to just argue that for you with uh, my simple idea of polarization. Remember, we talked about polarization of speed. Imagine you have only positive charged quark with uh, uh, you know uh, massless quark with chirality. If you turn on a magnetic field, let's say U quark, then spin will be polarized because of magnetic moment. Okay, you have more spin up particle than spin down particle. This is just magnetic polarization. Now, if in addition to that you have you know chirality, that means there is a chirality polarization. Well, that means that suppose you have more right-handed than left-handed, then the then the momentum of the individual particle will be polarized to be preferably along the spin direction. Now you couple these two together. Spin is polarized by, by magnetic field. Momentum is polarized by spin. In the end, you have more particle, more quark with the momentum along the magnetic field than against the magnetic field. And th these quarks are charged, negatively charged. So that, of course, is, a, is an electric car. So that's basically the way, simple intuitive way to understand what happened in this kind of CME. Now, there are many other sources. The recently we published a paper uh, in Nature Review Physics uh, discussing the physics uh, for bro uh, you know broader audience, you know, un understandable to to people who are not working in high physics. So, if you're interested, you can take a look. There's also a, uh, a, a review article from a few years ago. Uh, there are many other excellent sources recently. So, how so we want to see that in in high band collision? Okay, so that's not easy. It turns out. Uh, so, what could be the signal? The CME transport induced a charged dipole distribution along the magnetic field direction. So this is our little QGP fluid magnetic field in, the, in this direction. If you have a CME current running like this up down, then you bring more positive charge to one tip of the fireball, more negative charge to the other tip of the fireball. That's what an electric current would do. And then all those extra charges are blown out by strong hydrodynamic expansion. In the end, what you see in the detector is a few extra positive charge coming upward and a few extra negative charge coming downward. This is a two dimensional illustration of the same physics. Basically, we're looking for that charge correlation pattern. This is a very specific charge correlation pattern. Positive with positive going Y up, negative with negative going Y down, okay? Very specific emission pattern. We want to look for that, okay? Uh, I don't want to go into technical details since this is a colloquium. So uh, I'm happy to discuss it with more, uh, you know, during the question and answer. So let me just cut, cut the sheet and say that have we, have we seen the CME? Well, a lot of effort already went into that. And it's continuing. First measurement uh, report was reported in 2009 by STAR. The efforts in the past decade uh, were made by STAR, Ali, CMS, at both RIC and RHC. Uh, the search extended from 10 GeV collision all the way to 5,000 GeV collision. Okay. Uh, we also looked at various colliding systems from PADA to Kappa Kappa, Gold Gold, and so on and so forth. It proved to be a very difficult search. Okay. The reason for that is that uh, there's a very small signal. We now understand that the signal itself is very small and it's being contaminated by a very strong background correlation. What are the background correlation? Look at here. Suppose you have a particle, a hadron, like the rho, rho meson that is produced in the collision and the rho decay into plus and minus. And those plus and minus are very collimated because they come from the same parent. And that plus and minus then generates a correlation which actually uh, you know, mask up the true CME correlation you want to look for. So this is one example. That's what is called hydronic resonance. And there are other sources of uh, you know, uh, charge-dependent correlation. Those are you know, huge background, and it's not easy to remove. Uh, but you know, experimentalists and also theorists together made a lot of effort to try to extract that you know, possible signal of CME. So this is a native compilation from the same review article by Dima and me recently. So you can see that from rig to RGC, there are many measurements. So uh, it looks like there is, a, there is certainly a hint of signal, especially in the only water of 100 GeV collision. Uh, it's not conclusive for sure. It's certainly it's perhaps one sigma, two sigma, certainly, certainly not three, four, five sigma, okay? So we're not there yet. And still we need some new idea and new approach to really nail this down. A related idea is something we call current magnet wave uh, due to limit time, I'm not going into that. I only want, want to say that's another possible way for the CME to turn up and show in the experimental data. And there are interesting ideas, uh, uh, namely a possible charge codable pattern from this kind of magnetic wave. And uh, actually Igor uh, and collaborators made uh, an important contribution to that kind of idea of codable separation uh, early on. 
so what's the big deal now? That's the isobar collision. And, and I, I'm, let me just say that it's really exciting right now. Uh, they, this exciting opportunity of discover of discovery through the isobar collision experiment uh, would, you know, perhaps show results in in months. So we're really getting there. Okay, and that's, that's of course that we should thank the our star uh, experimentalists who are working very hard recently and who have been working hard on this in the past two and three almost three years. Three billion events were corrected for each uh, isobar system. What's the idea? The idea is that you want to contrast two colliding systems, ruthenium with zirconium. They are supposed to have the same background because they have the same size of the nucleus, and they would have different signal because they have different number of protons in the collision to start with, and to have different strength of magnetic field. Indeed, quantitative simulation of those kind of initial conditions for the collision of ruthenium and zirconium do demonstrate that they have negligible difference in their bulk property, okay, like the inhibitor flow. And they do have a sizable 10 to 20% of difference in the magnetic field square. Okay. So there's a decent chance that by subtraction between the ruthenium and zirconium, you're going to be able to nail down that signal. There's a decent chance. Now, this is a compilation from experimentalism, in particular from Gang Wang at UCLA. So it, depending on how much signal you do have, the signal to background ratio, you will have different chance of you know, concluding uh, a, a signal from the isobar collision. If we are lucky, we could have a chance to reach several sigma. Okay. For now, of course, we're not sure. Again, if you're interested, you can look more into this review article. Now, uh, we also have developed a theoretical tool because it's very, very important that we make quantitative prediction uh, for the CME signal and also quantify the relevant background. Uh, and for that, we need a really good uh, simulation tool. And that's something we call e event by event uh, along with code fluid dynamics. So this was developed in the last couple of years uh, you know, within the best collaboration effort. Recently, we published a paper together with Professor De Fu Ho and, and also our students, uh, Shu De Shi and Hui Zhang. Uh, in this paper, we uh, introduced this tool and we uh, put on the table a set of quantitative uh, you know, prediction. So again, I, I don't think it's useful to go into the technical details, but just want to say that if we have the data coming out, we should be able to tell uh, you know, with certain statistical uncertainty that you know, whether there is a signal or not. So stay tuned, we are probably really close. Uh, how many minutes do I have, Igor? It's not very strict, so you could have a couple of min more minutes if you want. Okay, thank you. And I think we kind of uh, started a date, right? So, so I, I, in the last several minutes, I have only a few slides. So let me then uh, this. Uh, so so far, I told you two examples. Now let me come to my third example, and let's come back to just a few quarks instead of a soup of a thousand of quarks. Let's come back to a few quarks. You know, uh, uh, and in particular, let's focus on the so-called charm quark, heavy quark, okay? Uh, charm quark, charm was discovered in 1974. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm assuming everybody perhaps knows this, uh, the Jepsai discovery in November, uh, in the so-called November revolution, which basically changed not only the, you know, QCD, but also the natural weak uh, community. I think that was a, you know, very uh, important moment in the history of the standard model. Uh, where uh, you know it was quickly convinced, uh, it, it was it was uh, you know it quickly convinced everybody about you know the kind of flavor scheme of the uh, electro weak theory and also establishing QCD itself. So uh, that was basically through the measurement of or discovery of so-called charmonium C and C bar. Okay, this is that peak here from the Brookhaven experiment and also the peak here from the Slack experiment. Okay, the C and C bar are bounces that we call the GF sign. Now, C and C bar system provide an excellent system for studying and understanding, you know, uh, non-parallel force in QCD. Let me tell you that today there are still so many people who are studying charmonium, both in the hadronic phase community and in the heavy ion phase community. Okay, and for example, uh, it it offers a unique opportunity for uh, studying the exotics. You have a suppose you have a C and C bar. Now, how about putting a few more uh, Q and Q bar, and you can make, for example, a type of quark like this. Indeed. Uh, people were speculating of uh, this kind of possibility early on, like in the 1970s. Uh, but really, the exotic started to be found experimentally only in the new century in 2003. I believe the first firmly established example uh, was discovered in 2003, precisely in the charmonium system. And that was what people called as X3872. I think now it has a new name, uh, Kai, uh, I forgot, Kai1C. 
Uh, anyway, it used to be called X3872. 3872 uh, is, is math, okay? So it's believed to uh, contain a C and C bar, and then a pair of uh, night quark, U, U bar or UD bar, you know, depending on the flavor content. Now, this is what the first discovery example. Now there are like hundreds of those, you know, X, Y, Z states. Uh, and uh, hydronic physicists are working very hard to understand what actually is in there, okay, in the X3872. It turned out it was even, you know, almost, you know, 18 years from its initial discovery uh, at the Bell experiment, uh, we're still far from a complete understanding of the secret of that, okay? For example, people were not sh are still not sure uh, whether this is a very compact object like our proton and neutron, you know, is that a, you know, water Fermi compact tetraquark? Or maybe it's a large size, you know, molecular state of two hadrons. Okay, these two possibilities are so different. And naively you would say, how could you be wrong about that? But it turned out we're still not sure yet which is which. You know, which one is the correct or the dominant structure for X3872. Now here's the question: Can we help, re you know, resolving this quark mass difficulty from relativity nuclear collision? Okay. I, I, I think, it, uh, you know, there's a, there's a really, really good opportunity here uh, in the heavy ion physics. I call this a high CQGP at order 1000 GeV collision. So let me first show you two plots from uh, PBM, okay? Uh, these are some measurements from Alice for the D0 open heavy flavor containing one charm quark and for GFSI from two charm with a charm and anti-charm. So basically the idea the, the, or the point here is that you can see the production of D and it's Psi are much, much higher than your uh, thermal model prediction. For the D, it's about 30 times enhancement compared with your thermal model prediction. Or for the Jeff Psi, like 900. Well, how to understand 900? 900 is 30 times 30, right? Because Jeff Psi had two C. The key message here is that, you know, in QGP itself, give you zero C and C bar. So see that you can remember C and C bar together. Uh, if you want to use the thermal energy to, you know, create a C and C bar, that requires at least three GeV of energy. Okay, that's the math for the C and C bar. Now your temperature is about 300 MeV, so your Boltzmann separation factor is exponential to the minus 10, which is basically zero. So there's basically zero C and C bar out of thermal fluctuation. All the C and C bar you get is from the initial hard scattering, and that's where this thousand GeV collision makes the difference. Namely, the RHC energy makes the difference. In those collisions, you are creating a heavy doping QGP. Heavy means C and B, and mainly C, okay? Yeah, and that's perfectly illustrated by the plot here, right? We have 30 times more than the you know, uh, you know, thermal model expectation. Of course, here, large, I put the word large quote on code because apparently there are still a lot less C quark than the light quark. But that's still, that's large enough, okay? Uh, for, you know, for example, central collision at LHC energy, 5G, 5TV, you could have a large, uh, like 100 C and C bar in a single event. So that's not a negligible small number, and that provides new opportunity. And I call that a high C QGP, okay? It's ideal for producing heavy exotic particles. You know, for hydronic physics, they, you know, try to create the exotic from electron positron collision or proton proton collision. You have to create all the needed quarks you know, uh, C and C bar and all the light quarks. Here we have a different environment. We have a QGP to start with, which have had thousands of U and D, right? And then you have about a hundred of C. So isn't that perfect for creating heavy exotic? And that's indeed what we recently started to to under, to, to, to study. And uh, let me say, to be fair, there were people uh, who were thinking about this, like, uh, you know, maybe 10 years before. There were some, you know, pioneering ideas about it. But I think, uh, it really become more interesting and important recently for a few reasons. First of all, you know, we have now, you know, a very good idea of how many charms we will have at LHC energy. And second, the first set of X3872 uh, measurements start to emerge from CMS and from LHCB around 2019. So now it's really nice getting to the time for studying the high C QGP. Okay. The reason we publish a paper uh, to, to try to help our hydronic physics friends uh, to distinguish those you know, two scenarios, a hadronic molecular scenario for the X or a tetraquark, compact tetraquark scenario for the X. So what's the difference in the high ion context? Well, in the high ion context, actually it's a lot easier to produce the molecule uh, than producing 
the tab recording. This tab is obvious because there's a volume effect here, right? You have a large volume. For node C and C bar, you get from the initial hardware scattering, they're going to be diffusing around and you know be all over the QGP. So there's a much bigger chance for you to have a C and C bar that are far apart than being close to each other. So if your uh, X is a molecule with a large you know, spatial size, it's much easier to form okay, uh, uh, in the high value environment. Also, there are many night quarks around, so that makes it easy to produce. But the main difference is the, is the volume factor. And that leads to a drastic difference in the yield between the two structures. It's about 200 water magnitude between them. Furthermore, it gives a very different dependence on the centrality. You can see, if you have a contact tetra quark, producing that X is almost like producing a GIF site. Or in this case, it's very different. It's, it's very sensitive to the volume of your fireball. Therefore, when you go from central collision to peripheral collision, it drops very quickly, okay? So that's very, very actually uh, interesting signature what that you here? can potentially use. What's here? To show here in, in, in blue and uh, oh, okay. red is different, right? Yeah, the red is uh, yeah. the calculation of the yield uh, across centrality for the molecular structure picture. Or the blue is for tetra quark, compact tetra quark picture. Okay. So I think there is a good and interesting chance if uh, have an collision, uh, you know, experiment can measure that centrality dependent, uh, uh, you know, or by, you know, doing measurement over different side system. Okay. There's a good and interesting chance. We also calculated that production, you know, uh, in more differentially, for example, the rapidity or, or uh, moment, uh, transverse moment of dependence. We also computed actually the first, uh, you know, uh, calculation uh, for the uh, elliptic flow for the X. If you can produce a decent, decent number of, uh, uh, you know, X, you should have a, a non-zero elliptic flow. And indeed we see a positive elliptic flow. Uh, so this, these are the red uh, boxes here. Those data are for other heavy flavor particles like the D and also the GIF size. They're not the X, okay? So just sort of uh, the guideline to, to have an idea of how large an elliptic flow you could possibly measure for the X3872. So let me, uh, I think uh, this all is just getting started, okay? Let me quote what we said in the, at the end of the paper. This paper was done in collaboration with uh, uh, our uh, collaborators in uh, Guangzhou, Hongxi, Chen, Enke, and, and Hui. Uh, we basically conclude that it is tempting to envision an exciting time of vibrant and coherent theory and experiment efforts for exploring the heavy ion collision of the massive production factory of exotic hadron to its fullest extent. I think it's gonna be very exciting. Uh, so that, with that, let me come to the summary of my talk. I want to repeat this slide and just to say that, uh, you know, heavy ion collisions are not done yet. Uh, last year I gave uh, two colloquia, uh, you know, at different places. And uh, one question I got, uh, which was the interesting question that, you know, uh, uh, EIC uh, plan uh, was decided and, you know, Rick is going to be shut down. You know, uh, you know what are, what, what's going to happen to heavy ion? Well, here it would be my answer. There are actually a lot of interesting opportunities here, even for the third decade after the rig start, we can explore uh, the heavy ion collision of the factory for exotic quantum matter. At a very high energy, 1000 GeV energy end, we can explore a high CQGP, where there, there may be interesting opportunity for understanding exotic hadron and maybe possibly other heavy flavor physics. And at the relatively low energy, we have beam energy scan tools that, uh, that are just coming out. And we have interest in physical related to chirality, vortex, and magnetic field. So I think these open uh, many novel dimensions of the nuclear uh, nuclear matter universe. So I hope that those are going to keep us busy for the next decade. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you very much for a nice presentation. Uh, now we will have some time for questions. And Carl is the first to go. Carl. Uh, we cannot hear you, even though you are unmuted. Carl, no sound. Doesn't work now. We we, um, we heard a little bit. 
I don't think I can hear anything. My, my, my short comment here. Go ahead. Slide four. It's just a comment here. Come English physics here. Just a comment here. Slide four. Oh, okay. Now, now I can hear. Slide four. Yeah. Okay. That's one here. I mean. Here? Right here. Uh, we see it here. Oh, oh here. Just a comment as usual. Kinetic eh? physics here. It works fine. Photo, uh, blue, uh, photons here. But next slide so it's in crucial. Gluons have gluons, 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 and so on here. Right? It's a comment here, right? Here it works. Here, right. This is excellent, right? Here. But the slide before is confusion, right? It, it's important to see it here. Slide when slide uh, four. Okay. He, here. You missed it, right? You missed them here. Here and this here. Oh, you mean here I didn't put the uh, the, the right, picture. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's just because of the limited space. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um it seems that uh, Carl may have some problem with the microphone or something. We cannot hear him. So let's go to the next question for now, and then we will return to Carl's question if we sort it out somehow. So uh, Grigory Volovic, please. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you uh, for a very good uh, talk. Uh, uh, what about no-go theorem uh, for the chiral magnetic effect and chiral logical effect uh, that the color in equilibrium, the current uh, should be zero? Okay. Okay, that's, that's a good question. And that I think we're discussing many times at various uh, meetings. And I think that was indeed an important and relevant point. So really that uh, to be precise, uh, the paramagnetic effect has to be an out, even though we sometimes often say in thermal equilibrium, but you know, to be uh, to be rigorous, it's an out equilibrium phenomenon. Uh, the out equilibrium is mainly required for this new fight because the octal charge of course, strictly speaking, not conserved. Uh, and therefore, if you are talking about absolute thermal equilibrium, of course, you're not, never going to get that mu five. So you really have to bring that mu five out of the equilibrium, and uh, that's indeed what we actually have. So uh, you know, typical collision, uh, you have an axial charge from initial condition that's just due to Gluon topological fluctuation, and that is not going to uh, dissipate away quickly. For example, there are, there are many studies that are calculated by people like uh, Shulin and uh, Defu and, and Hongwu and, and many others. Uh, basically, uh, that you know, the question is the competition between the relaxation time scale of your axial charge or chiral asymmetry, and your your uh, let's say momentum uh, or thermalization time scale. So, if you have a long enough of, uh, time scale for the axial charge to relax, then you have a, uh, a window of of out of of out of equilibrium chirality. Okay, uh, thank you. But uh, uh, in our case, in helium-3, we have uh, different ways how to avoid that, uh, because uh, we, we can do that even in equilibrium. Uh, but in our case, uh, the total current is zero, but the current in bulk, for example, is compensated by the current of the surface. Uh, uh -huh. there are the other ways, for example, uh, the current is along the vortex, uh, and it is and uh, the current along all the vortices in, uh, in the lattice of vortices, uh, they're compensated by the counter current uh, in bulk. So you, the, but you perhaps still have to have a way to separate somehow the uh, positive and negative current contribution, right? If you just put them together, they're still gonna add to zero, I guess. Uh, oh, for example, in, uh, 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 inside the vortex, we have the anomaly, and due to the anomaly, there is a current along the vortex uh, uh -huh. in, uh, in uh, current vortical effect. Uh, but uh, uh, outside, there is no uh, current anomaly, but the, the current is just compensating uh, the uh -huh. current due to the current anomaly. I see, I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for pointing this out. Okay. Um, any other questions? Carl, did it sort out with the microphone? Can you try to speak now? I don't think we can hear. Okay. Um, it doesn't seem to be working. So 
Any other questions in the meantime before um, we somehow resolve that problem? I do have a question uh, of my own. So um, the question, actually there are several. One of them is regarding page 25 on your slides, which is near where you are right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when you were showing the difference of the polarization of lambda bar and lambda on the left figure, it mm -hmm. seems like it's decreasing with the energy. So uh, I'm trying to understand sort of what's going on. And naively, when you go to higher energies, you would get stronger magnetic field and perhaps smaller vorticity because the angular momentum will be basically passing through mostly and a little will be left in the, in the central collision. So in the, in the plasma actually, so it seems like the effect of the magnetic field should grow with the energy, not decrease. And what you are showing seems to be the opposite. No, yeah, you mean uh, the difference? The, you, you mean over what the difference kind of... should sh should increase yeah. with the energy uh, naively? You, you you have to increase. That's what you said, right? The effect of the magnetic field will increase with the energy because yeah, that's, the field okay. gets stronger. I, I see what you mean. Uh, that's why actually uh, we, I put a late time. So here it's important that the, the, those hadrons are produced at the very end of the collision, a, cup, a few fermions into the collision uh, at the so-called freeze out time. So uh, the important thing is not how large your magnetic field you start with. The important thing is that how large your magnetic field you still get by the time of freeze out. I, I perfectly understand you're saying that the initial magnetic field should increase with beam energy, but you know that lifetime of the magnetic field also uh, decrease with beam energy. So let's say at 100 GeV or 200 GeV collision, your magnetic field life is so, so short that it does not till the uh, freeze out time when the hadrons are produced. I see, I see, I see. Yeah. Uh, but the angular momentum will be also uh, decreasing in the same way rapidly with the energy. So that's correct. The overall effect should also decrease, right? So yeah. The overall effect, you can see, these are the trend of the overall effect. I see, uh, I see, I see. Yeah. So all the effects are basically decreasing with the energy, but uh, if you consider uh, lowering the energy, somehow the effect of the magnetic field is gradually increasing with decreasing energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I see, I see, I see, okay. Um, other questions? Um, I'm not sure if that's the previous question or the new question, uh, Grigori, you have another question? No, it's, uh, uh, it's another question just about uh, this figure. Uh, so uh, what uh, you, you say that there's a huge vorticity. Does it mean that uh, the whole uh, object uh, rotates uh, like solid body? Is it solid body rotation? Uh, it, it, well, the QGP is not, it's not a, like a rigid object, right? It's, no, no, it's no, 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 no. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, if, uh, uh, if you have the constant rotation, this means that the whole object uh, is rotating uh, as a solid body. I assume it's a, a differential rotation. rotation. Yeah. Sorry? It's not a whole rotation, no, it's not. It's more like this. Uh, so this is the X direction, this is the Z direction. If you're looking down to the X, Z direction, these are indicating the vorticity, the different colors. So uh, you have many local vorticity patterns, but not a real kind of, you know, uh, you know like, like a solid rotation. Yeah, it's, it's very different. No, In the, uh, if you have the liquid, uh, then if you have the uh, many vorticity in the same direction, then it means that you have the solid body rotation. Uh, they're not even in, the, that's actually a good question. So they're, they're not even in the same direction. In some region it's pointing up or pointing down because the whole fluid has also a, uh, uh, how to put it, a shear, you know, because uh, the whole fluid is expanding. So not only that there is an angular moment, there is also a large, uh, strong collective expansion itself. So, so it's, it's a, uh, what I mean that in the collision is actually a quite complicated uh, uh, vorticity pattern. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, other questions? Uh, Carl, maybe you want to type your question in the in the chat. I would read it for you if, if the mic doesn't work. Um, I don't see any questions from the audience. I do have another question about page thirty-eight, where you were talking about the tetra walk and. I was trying to understand uh, the following thing. You were saying uh, kind of clearly how 
you understand the dependence on the centrality because the uh, molecular type uh, model is sort of large. And of course, in a large system, it will be more likely to form in everything. But what I'm not sure is the effect of sort of melting. If you have that molecular kind of model, wouldn't the uh, medium in which it is produced be basically decohering the object and it will be falling apart, not being created? And on the other hand, you seem to suggest the opposite that it will be much more likely to be created. Uh, that, that's a very good question. So, uh, so uh, heavy on collision is a very dynamic process. You you know you start with it's like I, I think what you said essentially is something. Just like let's say jet size suppression, put in this way, yeah. Uh, uh, the re the question is that you know when they are produced. That's a crucial thing. So if you uh, you are calculating particles that are produced at the very end after freeze out, uh, then you would uh, you know it's not a hundred percent safe assumption, but it's a good assumption that uh, there's a very little uh, medium uh, effect uh, at least in terms of chemical kind of freeze out that you would say the particle will survive. Uh, that's basically, uh, you may say that it's like, you know, a chemical freeze out in some sense. So what we do in this kind of calculation, of course, we do a typical bulk evolution. And of course we put a uh, charm in there and together evolve. And at the end of evolution, when the particles freeze out, we use coalescence to calculate the chance to form this guy or to form this guy, depending on their individual uh, information uh, or structure. So that's what we do. So that's basically at the end, just like the, at the freeze out, they are produced at the freeze out. You're asking whether in the later hydronic phase, there's a chance that uh, this guy is more likely to be destroyed. Uh, I think at this point, one cannot rule out that possibility, but we're assuming that it is small uh, for this study. I see. So what I was saying, you kind of turning around. So if in the no, plasma- no, not trying to turn around. To destroy, no, 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 it is, it is because <laughs> If it's more likely to destroy by plasma, in a way, the production rate is nearly the same, but now it happens not during the actual when it's boiling, but at the time when it sort of freezes out. Yeah. Uh, and and you can see actually what you said is important because uh, it, all the C and C bar initially, when they're initially produced from hard scattering, they are actually together, meaning spatially close. But then, you know, the QGP will bring them apart. So eventually, if you look at a typical QGP, those seeds are scattered around the plasma. They are not very close between a C and a C bar. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have the kind of C, you know, GFC suppression, basically. Okay, okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, now we do have that question from Carl. Uh, so I'll read it on his behalf. So he's, he writes, I was wondering about Carl vertical e effect which signatures could be induced by CEV and how would it be different from CME signatures? Okay, I see. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, uh, people discuss this from time to time. Uh, and I think there was a paper some time ago uh, by uh, DT Song and, and uh, Dima. Uh, they were suggesting to measure baryon separation uh, in a way similar to the uh, charge separation. Uh, there were some initial effort to look at, for example, uh, hyperon and a proton uh, uh, correlation. This, uh, you know, similar idea. So the vertical effect, of course, is not going to cause a charge separation, but is uh, possibly causing a, uh, you know, a separation of the baryon charge. And uh, actually, that was one of the initial reasons why I wanted to to look into this vorticity. It, uh, as I already said, so the vorticity turned out to be small at high energy. So that's another difficulty to look for it. So it might be that, I don't know. I mean, people have never tried this. People only did some initial uh, kind of uh, measurement for the 200 GeV. So there is a chance maybe at a lower energy where the vorticity is much bigger, there could be, a, and also baryon number is larger. There could be a chance that uh, chiral vertical effect might be more visible in that region. But again, there's no measurement yet. Okay. Okay. Um, any other questions before we wrap this up? Okay. I don't see any raised hands. So at this moment, I would like to thank uh, Jing Peng once again for a very nice presentation, taking time to answer the questions. And thanks on behalf of everybody. I see the claps in the audience. Thanks.
Thank you, Igor.